doing? Good. Hey, real quick, welcome to those of you guys in the East Auditorium, uh, out in the lobby as well. We're glad that you guys are here. So good to be here with you worshiping today. Before I jump in uh, to this message, um, I just want to invite you to come back next week as we celebrate Father's Day together. We're going to be kicking off a brand new summer message series called At the Movies, uh, where we're going to be looking at uh, different movies and uh, pulling out the, the, the principles, the spiritual principles out of those movies. And so next week we are kicking things off uh, with Sandlot which believe it or not, there's some great principles in there. Uh, we're going to be looking at Sandlot, and we obviously won't be watching the whole movie together. Same length of service times, uh, but it's going to be great. We're going to have a good time on Father's Day. we got some giveaways. Uh, we're going to have popcorn uh, as we kick off at the movies. So uh, come and join us next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, today we are wrapping up this message series called 100, and it's just a short two-week series that we kicked off last week. And, you know, I, when it comes to money, sometimes, uh, you know, just to keep it real as a pastor, I'm like, oh man, like kind of dreading talking about this because I know what people's perceptions are. But then the closer we get and the more I start to study in preparation for the sermons, I just get so excited. I, I so look forward to teaching because, man, God's principles that are in the scriptures work. They just do. And, and they work because he created us. So he knows how life works best. And if we will just open up his book and read and then apply it to our lives, man, I am telling you, uh, we experience the abundant life that he desires for us to experience. It's, um, it's like this. Um, I, I, we, get, we have a minivan, and I, I have a little bit of OCD, and so when one of those lights comes on, it drives me nuts. And our tire pressure light, literally for the last six months, uh, has been popping on. And I, I've gone to two different tire places trying, like, I, listen, I don't care if my tire pressure's okay, I just want the light off. You know what I'm saying? Like, it... See, if the tire pressure is good, that's a bonus. But the light just with my OCD drives me nuts. I just, I want that little light off. And uh, so I've gone to two different tire places and they're like, okay, Mr. Ornbrook, we got them filled up to 25 PSI. Everything should be good to go. The light will click off within a mile of when you pull away. And both times, I'm so excited for that light to go off and it never goes off. And so finally, I pulled out, I reached into the glove compartment, I pulled out the owner's manual and I looked and it says that you're supposed to fill it up to 36 PSI. And I'm like, oh. So m m I go to the gas station, I fill it up, and guess what, the light goes off. And I'm like, this is amazing, you know? And I'm like, man, I should have gone to the owner's manual first. And, and, and here's why. Because the people who made that van know how it works best, and they wrote it down, and it's all right there in the glove compartment, that little owner's manual. And I've been going to people who understand tires and all of that, and, and, and their opinion was it was 25, but when I looked at what the van was created for, it was 36. And there's a slight difference, but it made all the difference. And listen, friends, God created us. So there are all kinds of people who write books and speak, and they go, man, this is how life works best. But the reality is, if we want to really know how life works best, all we have to do is open up the owner's manual the scripture, the word of God, and we find it. And God, man, he gives us these incredible principles uh, when it comes to, to all kinds of areas of our life, but particularly to this area, which can cause so much stress and wreak so much havoc in our lives if we let it, and that's money. And last week, as we kicked off the series, and if you missed it, I'd love for you to go to discoverychurch.com, click on uh, the link uh, on our website, and you can watch last week's message. But the foundation, the foundational principle of last week's message and understanding this whole 100 plan is this, that God owns everything. That God owns everything. And most of us don't think about it that way. Most of us think about it this way. We, we, you know, there's a chart. There's um, what, what is ours, which is, hey, this is my job. 
which makes me my money and it's my success and it's my car and it's my house and it's my family and it's my health. God's got the weather, <laughs> which praise God we live in Southern California, right? Not like North Dakota where the weather's horrible. But, but, but you know what happens? Life happens and the stuff hits the fan. And Jesus tells us, we don't need Jesus to tell us, but he tells us in the scriptures, he says, man, in this world, you will have trouble. Like, that's just part of it. And you know what happens when trouble comes? All of a sudden, we lose our job, and we're like, okay, God, this is yours. Like, God, you're, you're, you're going to have to provide a job for me. And money starts coming in, and you're like, okay, God, this is, this is yours. God, you're going to have to provide for me. God, if you love me, you'll provide for our family. Like, I don't know where the next mortgage payment's come from, but God, you can do this. And all of a sudden, it's God's money. And you're waiting on the next promotion, and you're like, Lord Jesus, please let me get the promotion. And all of a sudden, God, this success is up to you. And then the transmission goes down in the middle of the desert, you know, in the middle of the night. And you're like, okay, Lord, you got to fire this thing up. And you're laying hands on the car, right? praying in Jesus' name. And you go, oh, okay, well, God, God, this is yours. Do something here. And, you know, the house starts to fall apart, and you're like, okay, God, I, I, you, you got to do something here. Like, we, we, we need a good roof over our head. And then your kids go off the rails, and you're like, God, these are your kids. You're going to have to straighten them out, God. Like, I've done my part. They're, they're, they're yours. And, and then you get the diagnosis that you don't expect. And all of a sudden, you're like, okay, God, doctor said there's nothing you, they can do. God, I need you to step in and do something. You can do this. You can do this. I'm yours. You see, it, it's not fun when life hits the fan. But when life hits the fan, it puts everything into perspective, doesn't it? That everything is God's. Everything. Everything. Last week, we read Psalm 24. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything, everything in it. Everything belongs to God. A hundred percent belongs to God. That's why we called this series 100. God owns it all. We are not the owners. We are simply asset managers. That, that we are to manage whatever God has entrusted to us. And, and last week we asked the question, um, can God trust me with his money? And we look at God and, and we go, God, can I trust you with my money? Can I trust you with my life? And God's looking back going, no, 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 no. Can I trust you with my money? The money that I entrust to, to you, will you handle it? Will you manage it in a way that will honor me? in a way that will bless you? Or would you try and do it on your own? And if you weren't here last week, uh, you may have missed um, uh, the only time that the church passes out money. Um, I, when you walked in last week, were handed an envelope with a dollar in it. And I explained to you that um, this is not the church's money. This is my money from my account. Actually, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the people at the info center came up to me and said, hey, just... Just so you know, after first service, someone brought the envelope back to put it in the box and it said Lindsay's money on it. So just so you know, it's Lindsay's money. You know, that's my wife. Um, but I, I gave you this envelope with a dollar and I said, here, I, I want you to carry this around this week, all week. So whenever you open up your wallet or your purse and you see the dollar, you see the envelope, you'll remember that's my money. And, and, and my kids need to eat towards the end of the month, right? When I get, uh, I said the only reason I could do this illustration is because it's June the 2nd, right? I had just gotten paid for the month, okay? And so, um, so I said, hey, bring it back next week. And by the way, if you brought it back, thank you. Uh, that you can, there's a red box. Don't, hopefully you didn't put it in the offering when it was passed. It's not the church's money, okay? And, um, you know, I had a lady that, uh, she sent me an email uh, this week, and she said, Chris, I just got a question. Are you trying to test us? Because in the scriptures, Jesus tells a parable, you know, about a guy who gave um, servants money, and one of them buried it, and then just gave him the, you know, the, the bag of silver back. And 
he was upset, you know, because he didn't put it to use. So she's like, she typed out like, so should I listen to Jesus or you? And I, <laughs> I'm like, always Jesus, but this is a completely different illustration. I'm like, just bring your $1 back. And uh, uh, I, I'm like, don't bring any more back, okay? I, in, any more than what we put in will go straight to planning a church. If anyone did go against my advice and say, don't bring any extra back, just bring the dollar. Anything extra is going to go to plant a church uh, through our church. Um, but uh, Rust, uh, Pastor Rusty up in Valencia at our campus up in Valencia, uh, we did the same illustration last week. And uh, he had a guy that uh, emailed him and said, hey, great news. I went and bought a lottery ticket and won $17. So you're going to get $17 back. And we just got a kick out of that and laughed. I'm like, bro, my discovery people know better than to do that. So anyway, um, but the, the reason I wanted you to carry it, the reason I did that is to feel the weight of, and the responsibility of carrying someone else's money and doing what they ask with it. Because every week we carry around God's money and we have a responsibility to, to do with it what he wants done with it. And, and so uh, the, the big principle that we have to understand to carry out this 100 plan is that God owns everything. He owns everything. And last weekend, uh, we kicked this off, and I shared with you this very simple financial plan uh, based on the principles out of God's word called the 100 plan. And sometimes the plan is called the 10, 10, 80 plan. Um, sometimes it's called the give, save, spend plan. Um, the, the idea is that with the first 10% of our income, so whenever we get paid with the t first 10%, that we would give it away. That, that from the very beginning in Genesis, and some people go, oh, Chris, and, and God calls this the tithe. And, 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 and some people go, oh, well, the, the tithe was an Old Testament principle. It was part of the Old Testament law. And, and my response is, no, it was before the Old Testament law. It was from the very beginning in Genesis, God knew that we as his people would be prone to trust in money or stuff rather than to trust in him. And so from the very beginning, he tells his people, hey, every time you harvest your crop, every time you get paid, I want you to give away the first 10% to care for other people, to impact other people's lives. I command you to do this. I want you to learn how to trust me. That's what Deuteronomy 14.23 says, that the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. And so that, that first 10%, it's, man, for my wife and I, in our budget, it, it is non-negotiable. We were taught this when we were young, uh, that this is what God asks his people to do every time they get paid, to give away the first 10% uh, to care for others, to advance his kingdom. And so for us, that is absolutely non-negotiable. No matter what's going on in our lives, Whatever comes in, the first 10% goes automatically to God. And the, the, the purpose of tithing, as the word says, is to teach us to always put God first in our lives. So that first 10% is to be given away. The, the second 10% uh, is to be saved, is, is to be saved. And listen, this is... Um, uh, the the principle, the, the ten num percent number, is just a suggestion. It's what my mentor taught me. It's what I've read in books. That that ten percent is not like a, a biblical thing, like the tithe. But the principle of saving is a biblical principle, B because, like Jesus said, in this world you will have troubles. And so the Word of God tells us, the 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 teachings of the Scripture tell us that in, if we are wise that we will put back money so that we will be prepared when times get tough. And listen, again, guys, the word of God works. It just does. Even if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I would highly recommend it living on this 10, 10, 80 plan because it works. We find peace 
We find joy when we live the way of the Word of God. And listen, even though the Word of God says this, you and I, again, whether you're a Christian or not, we know this intuitively that we should be saving money, right? I mean, we go, oh, I'm, not, I'm not saving as much. If we're living off of everything, if we're spending everything that comes in, there's something deep within us that goes, man, I should probably be saving. I should probably be putting back some money. I should probably be saving for retirement. I should probably be saving for kids' college. Money Magazine recently released a study that said one in three Americans have zero saved for retirement. Zero, which is scary. And if you're in your 20s or your 30s or you're younger than 20, listen, I am telling you, if you will just take a little bit out of your paycheck, if you will just put this, this second 10% in, man, the, the law of compounding interest, which you can Google, man, you will be all good by the time that it's time for you to retire. And so don't wait to start thinking about retirement till you're in your 40s or 50s. Can I get an amen from the older generation? Right? But we, we are a people who are prone to just live off of everything and lived way beyond our means. But the scriptures tell us to that, that we should save. And so this 100 plan is give the first 10%, save the second 10%, and then live off of the 80% that's left. Which sounds simple, right? But as good as it sounds, we push back. And we go, man, you know, we, we live in Southern California. The cost of living, it's just outrageous, and it is. But listen, if we will trust God, if we will rearrange our budget, I am telling you, it will lead to blessing in our life. And I've heard people say, oh, money won't make you happy. And then I hear other people say, well, I'd sure like to try. <laughs> right? And, and here's the thing, as I was studying this week, I discovered that there is actually a scientific connection between money and happiness. But it, it, it might, it's probably not the, the, the um, connection that you would think. Because the connection is not more money leads to more happiness. It's actually a different M word. And it's margin. That when you have margin, when it comes to money in your life, when you have margin and you're not living you know, paycheck to paycheck, but you've built margin into your life, when you have margin, researchers say you're up to 10% happier than those who don't. I would argue even more. Because I know the times in my life where I've had margin, man, there is just a peace that comes with that than when I don't have margin. Are you with me? And so there is a connection between money and happiness. It's just not more money leads to more happiness. It's actually more margin leads to more happiness. But listen, this requires us to actually be intentional in putting these things into practice. Now, real quick, I want to walk through um, three barriers to actually living out this 100 plan in your life. Three barriers to living out the 100 plan. The first is this, that greed is a barrier to giving. That, that greed in our lives is a barrier to us actually giving as God instructs for us to give. And we push back and we go, well, I'm not greedy. And, and listen, I know that you're not greedy, but in all of us, there is some greed. And the hard part is, is that greed does not show up in the mirror when you look. It is impossible to spot greed in your own life. But listen, greed is merely the thinking that all of my stuff is for me. That's all greed is. It's thinking all of my stuff is for me. It's to make me happy. Because that's what life is all about. That's all greed is. And the problem with greed is that greed has a huge appetite, doesn't it? 
Like it's an appetite that is never fully or finally satisfied. And so if you're going to spend everything on you, guess what? You don't stop when you run out of money. If you're going to spend everything on you, that it feeds that appetite. It feeds that greed. And guess what happens? When you run out of money, you think, well, I could just wait until I get paid again, or I could wait till I save, but I can't wait. I need it now. So what do you do? MasterCard, you don't leave home without it. And it's like, oh, it, I need it now. And so rather than saving, what do you do? It leads to the second barrier, which is debt, which is debt. And debt is a barrier to savings. Because if you have debt, you can't save because you're always paying down debt. Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, says in Proverbs, he says that the borrower is slave to the lender. The borrower is slave to the lender. See, debt is when you become a slave to your own desire. And whenever you sign up for debt, regardless of the reason, it could be a good reason, like school. And whenever you sign up for debt, you surrender your peace. And you just need to know that going in. I I have friends, and man, I... I just keep praying that, you know, I have five kids that are 10 years old and under. I just keep praying that something happens with college between now and like eight years from now. Like something has to give, right? Because it's almost getting to the point where it doesn't even make sense. Like I have friends who literally, they, they went through school and they had to rack up all kinds of debt for grad school and everything. And they are literally still paying school debt 20 years later. And they go, well, it's worth it. And, and it may be, but you know what? As the borrower, they're still slave to the lender. Because there are things that they want in their lives or that they want to do or trips they want to take, but they cannot do it because they're continuing to pay debt and debt and debt and debt. And, and listen, th- this school is one thing, maybe mortgage is another, but listen, we do this with credit card debt. We, we can't wait for something or, or something goes wrong. And we instead of saving, right? Instead of saving, instead of having an emergency fund, instead of being prepared, it's like we just put it on credit card. But then the debt adds up and adds up and the interest kicks in. And it's just, it's a downward spiral. And one of the barriers to this 100 plan, one of the barriers to saving and getting ahead is debt. It's debt. And then the last barrier, or the third barrier that we're talking about today is discontentment. And this is a barrier to living off a budget, um, living within our means. Discontentment ensures that I am never satisfied with what I have. Listen, I have a love-hate relationship with Instagram, right? My buddy gets a new boat and he's out on the lake with his kids. I never wanted a boat in my life until I saw his Instagram. And all of a sudden I'm like, Dang it, I wish I had that boat. I need that boat. Now, listen, I know I don't need the boat, but have you ever been there? Someone on your Instagram gets a new kitchen, and you're like, oh, I didn't know I needed that. I need that, right? You, you see an outfit. You, it doesn't, we see stuff on social media. We're completely content and satisfied, and then we see something on social media, and we're like, all of a sudden, it's just there's discontentment. And we think we need that. We need to dress like that, look like that, act like that, have that. And all of a sudden there's discontentment in our life and we can no longer live within our means and spend what we've put in our budget to spend. We need more. And this is one of the biggest barriers to this 100 plan. It's greed, debt, and discontentment. And friends, none of those things, greed, debt, or discontentment, are from God. God never wanted us to live with the heavy. None of those things are fun, are they? Greed, debt, and discontentment. None of those things are fun. None of them. We don't actually want those things in our life. But man, 
I, I, I cannot stress enough, God has so much more for us than these things. So if those are the barriers to the 100 plan, let me show you the blessing of the 100 plan. The blessing of the 100 plan is this, that giving leads to joy. Giving leads to joy. Giving is, giving is what always breaks the chains of greed. Every time. Giving always results in joy. In greed, there is no joy. In discontentment, there is no joy. In debt, there is no joy. But giving always results in joy. That, that's, why, that's why people say all the time, you hear people say all the time, it's better to give than to what? Did you know that's in the Bible? God teaches that. He goes, I created you. I know, man, it is going to be so much better for you to give than to receive. Your heart is going to be so much happier. The blessing of this 100 plan is when you trust God with that first 10% and you give, it brings about joy. The second blessing is when you save, it leads to peace. It leads to peace. The second blessing of the 100 plan is peace. Money in the bank leads to peace in the mind. When you have margin in your financial life, it results in peace. Saving, because you know there will be a year where it seems like everything that could go wrong does go wrong. Saving, for when that happens and being prepared, will lead to peace. Now, let me stop right here. There's a fine line we need to talk about. I believe, and I believe that most of you believe, that peace comes in Christ alone. Are you with me? Peace comes in following the ways of Christ alone. And the principles that we find in the scripture on how to deal with our finances. When we are trusting God, when we are following him, when we are living the way that he commands us to live, it leads to peace. And friends, debt does not lead to peace. Discontentment does not lead to peace. Greed does not bring you peace. So the blessings of the 100 plan are joy, peace, and the last one is this, that when you spend that 80%, when you live off a budget, it brings freedom to your life. When you choose to live on the rest, that last 80%, you are financially free. You just choose not to spend more than you make. And there's something so freeing about that concept. I was watching uh, Saturday, I know none of you guys are way too spiritual, watch Saturday Night Live, but I, was, I saw a rerun of Saturday Night Live and Steve Martin was in it, it's an old skit where he's with this couple and it's this infomercial, he's trying to sell a new book. And the book is titled, uh, How to Be Debt Free. And he's like, chapter one, don't spend more than you make. And they're like, oh. And he's like, chapter two, don't spend more than you make. And the guy's like, hold on. Like, but what if I really want it now? And he's like, chapter three, don't spend more than you make. And they were, Saturday Night Live was laughing because it's so counterintuitive to our world, right? But it's so stinking simple. Live within your means. Don't spend more than you make. And when you grasp this concept, friends, it is so freeing. It's so freeing. Linz and I, uh, like I've told you before, uh, my wife and I, we were taught these principles about 12 years ago. And so we sat down and we uh, wrote out a budget. And one of the things that my wife really struggled with early on, and, and even now, is she does not like spending money on herself which I, I'm really thankful for, that it's not the opposite. But she's fine with spending money on me. She's fine with spending money on the kids. But for her, she feels guilty when she spends money on herself. Like literally, no joke, her clothes will all have holes in them. And I'm like, babe, you gotta go get a shirt that doesn't have a hole in it. Like not, by the way, not the cool clothes that have holes on purpose, but like she's wore them so long. Like I have to go, babe, you, don't come home until you spend this money. Go buy yourself something new. I'm like, keep the romance alive for crying out loud. Uh, 
But she would always feel guilty. Well, guess what? When we created our budget, guess what we did? On the 80%, we labeled it, we, we called it blow money. Blow money, which sounds kind of bad, but guess what? We're living off a of budget. And so Lynn's got $80 a month. I got $80 a month. So every time when we got paid at the beginning of the month, that was just part of our budget. We'd get the cash out. She'd get $80 and I'd get $80. And guess what? She would go and she would buy herself clothes and she wouldn't have to feel guilty about it. She's like, this is my $80 to blow. And we built it into the budget. And guess what? I would take the $80 and I'd go out to eat for lunch. I love going out to eat. And I would kind of feel guilty going out to eat because my wife thought it was the craziest idea. She's like, let's just eat at home. It'll be better. It'll be healthier. And we won't have to waste money. And I'm like, I don't know, but I, I just like going to Chili's. I like the free chips and salsa. She's like, they're not free. You're paying for it, you know? But when you build it in to your budget, you don't have to feel guilty about it. Do you understand? There's freedom that comes when you build a budget and you only spend the 80% that's left. So let's begin to narrow in here. So the question is, how do you get started on this 100 plan? And I want to give you two quick things. Number one, it's going to take a decision. It's going to take a decision. Like you are going to have to decide, you know what? I am not going to handle money the way I've handled money in the past. I am going to choose to do whatever it takes to practice the principles that God puts in place. I'm going to rearrange that. It is going to require you making a decision, re re resolving that I am going to live off this 100 plan. And here's the thing. This is not difficult. It's just like working out. Working out is not difficult. It's all about the discipline, isn't it? it? Going to the gym is not difficult. It's the discipline of actually going to the gym. Are you with me? And the same is true. These principles are not difficult. But it requires discipline. It requires a decision to go, I am going to decide I am not going to live this way anymore. I am going to do whatever it takes to create margin in my life. Proverbs 21 verse 20 says this, says in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. Notice it does not say in the house of the wealthy are stores of choice food and oil. In the house of the rich are stores of choice food and oil. What does it say? In the house of the wise, the wise. You know what biblical wisdom is? Biblical wisdom is simply trusting God enough to do what he says. Being a wise person is going, okay, if God created me and God knows how life works best, I'm going to trust him even when no one else is, even when it doesn't make sense, even when the world's trying to talk me out of it, even when my flesh is trying to talk me out of it. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to do things his way. This is what it means to be wise. So he says, in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all that he has. Y'all, a foolish person spends everything. A, a foolish person is not intentional with their finances. And so their finances are intentional with them. A foolish person devours everything they have. But a wise person, a wise person has made the hard decision to not live beyond their means and actually store up some food and oil for when the days get tough. So to live out this 100 plan, friends, it requires that you make a decision and that you resolve to live the ways of God, that you believe that in that you will find contentment and peace and joy. The second thing it's going to take is a plan. This is huge. You got to have a plan. 
And I believe that the 100 plan is a great plan to start with. Proverbs 21 verse 5 says this, The plans of the diligent lead to profit, as surely as haste leads to poverty. The plans of the diligent lead to profit, as surely as haste, or like, uh, it'll, it'll work itself out. Uh, somehow it'll all come together. We'll, we'll make the payment. If not, you know, it, it, listen, this is hard because some of us are very spontaneous, right? And what a great gift that is to the world. Like, I, I am massively spontaneous, right? And Dave Ramsey says that usually in a marriage, someone is the spontaneous, he calls them the free spirit, and someone is the nerd who wants to, like, live off the budget. And he says, the nerd needs the spontaneous person to have a life, okay? And the spontaneous person needs the nerd to have a life. (laughs) Otherwise, it'll all be gone. And so those of us who are free-spirited, we're spontaneous. We want things now. It's, It's, listen, but I'm telling you, impulse buying a car is not a good idea. I know it from experience. Going to the vacation club thing and walking through, not a good idea for some of us, all right? Listen, you don't accidentally, accidentally drift into financial freedom. You drift into financial confinement. And and so I want to wrap with this. There's a huge difference between these two words, intentions and intentionality. Listen, some of us have the best intentions in the world. You know what the problem is with intentions, though? They're not real. They're all right here. They never actually become real. And here's what I want to encourage you. Some of you may go, man, I need this in my life right now. I need peace. I need joy. I need contentment. I need to get out of debt. I need to start trusting God. I need to rearrange. Listen, If that's you, I love that. I love that. But please understand that good intentions aren't going to get you anywhere. I went to the doctor last week. The doctor walks in. I hadn't been to the doctor in a year and a half. He goes, Chris, how many times do you exercise a week? I go, well, depends on what you define as exercise. And he says, well, and he starts naming some things. And I go, how about walking? And he goes, well... If it's a like 30 minute brisk intentional walk, I'll take that. And I go, okay, four times a week. And he leaves the room and I literally thought, that gum, you just lied to that guy. (laughs) And so then I'm like, should I get up and go get him and tell him I lied to him? And then I thought, no, because you're not, I didn't like mean to lie. Like I really in my head think I work out four times a week. Because I know I need to work out four times a week. Because I know that if I don't work out four times a week, I might have a heart attack and die or a stroke when I'm 45 years old. So I, I, I have every intention in my mind, I work out four times a week. And I literally, I sat in the doctor's office last week and I went back and forth in my mind and I thought, that is so pointless to lie to him. Why would I lie to him? He, he doesn't really care. Why would I lie to him? And then I thought, man, it's even more pointless that I would lie to myself, right? Because y'all, four times a week is just in my head. It's not real. I can want it all I want. Guess what? I'll still have a heart attack. You can sit here and want it. Peace, freedom, contentment, joy. You can want it all day long. But unless it gets out of your head, and you are intentionally creating a plan, it will not happen. It won't happen. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you, in order to remember the 100 plan, I want to give you the 100-day challenge. For the next 100 days, I want you to be intentional with practicing the principles of God with your finances. I want you to go home today, and if if you're single, grab a trusted friend. If you're married, for sure, grab your spouse and sit down and go, okay, here's our monthly income. Now let's rearrange it to where we have 10%, the first right off the top that we're giving away, 
10% that we're going to choose to save, and then we're going to live off the 80%. And we're going to have to become disciplined, and we're going to have to, you know, make some serious changes in our life, but we're going to do this. We are going to be intentional about living off a budget and telling every penny where it goes every single month so that our money doesn't tell us where to go. Where we own our money instead of our money owning us. So I want to challenge you, sit down today. Do not just let it be a good intention. Do not just be a hearer of the word of God. Be a doer of the word of God. Sit down and rearrange your finances so that you can work towards beginning to live off the 10, 10, 80 plan. It means killing greed in your life. It means killing debt in your life. It means killing discontentment in your life. You may need to log out of Instagram so that you're not tempted to go buy what you do not need. Right? But I am telling you, if you will begin to implement over the next 100 days, if you will track every single money, $15 at Wendy's, $25 $25 at the gas station, and you begin to write down everything you spend, and you begin to track it, and you become intentional, it will lead to joy and peace and contentment. I promise. I promise. Because God says so. It's going to be hard. It's going to require intentionality. You've got to make a decision, and you're going to need a plan. But I'm telling you, it will lead to financial freedom on the other side. Let's pray. God, uh, thank you for the power of your word. Uh, Thank you, God, for um, just loving us enough to give us and show us how to live. In areas of our lives, God, that, that matter, like finances, like our time, God, help us to be people who don't just hear your word, but who take hard steps to begin to put it into practice. God, I pray uh, for all of our friends here, for all of our church family here, God, that as we decide to begin to follow you and walk in obedience, that you would bless us. God, that we would begin to walk in freedom and joy and peace. God, for your glory, We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.